in the discussion that preceded, we addressed the first issue, which is, does Hebrews 10.25 require us or give us a divine mandate to meet on Sundays? And the answer is unequivocally no. But how did we get to this place? And why is God overturning these things now? We know from the book of Hebrews that he tells us that everything that can be shaken will be shaken, for we have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken, so we are to worship God acceptably with reverence and awe because our God is a consuming fire. Now, I want to read something to you and I want to center on this because this is what's happening now. This is what's happening now. In Hebrews 12 verse 18, I want to read several verses beginning at verse 18. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that which burned with fire. He's talking about Mount Sinai when Israel came before Mount Sinai and God came down on the mountain. He's talking about two mountains, Mount Zion and Mount Sinai. Mount Zion uh, is in Israel, Mount Sinai is in the Arabian desert. From Sinai the law was given, but from Zion grace is given. Now the contrast between these two mountains is a prophetic similitude, in fact it's a prophetic framework that defines the times in which we are. Let's go forward with the reading and I'll come back to the mountains. For you have not come to 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 the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. Israel begged Moses to go up and meet with God and they ran from the mountain and the presence of God. Verse 20 says, For they could not endure what was commanded and if so much as a beast touches the mountain it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid, and he trembled. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels and to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better uh, than that of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who speaks, for if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from Him who speaks from heaven, whose voice shook the earth, but now He has promised again saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, so that as of the things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since you are receiving, present continuous tense, you're continuing to receive, 
since you are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire." So he he tells us, in times of shaking, there's a distinction between that which cannot be shaken and that which is being shaken to be taken away. It's very important that the church understands that God is now in the process of shaking everything that can be shaken. Everything that is not a part of the kingdom of God is being shaken to be taken out of the way, to be taken out of the way. He talks then about Mount Sinai and the unshakable Mount Zion. Now Sinai of course, like I said, was in the desert of Arabia and uh, it was from the situs from which uh, the Ten Commandments and the Law of Moses was given. Moses was taken up to Mount Sinai after Israel had exited Egypt and God brought them to Mount Sinai. Moses went up and God gave him, uh, God invited the people to come up before He gave them the law because He meant to give them on that mountain that endowment of the kingdom of heaven that would have made them all a nation of priests, a a royal priesthood and a holy nation, a thing that was always what God meant to give to His people. But when they refused because they were afraid, then God then they were, they, they, they were they sent up an, an ambassador, sent up Moses, and God dealt with Moses rather than dealing with them. And he gave the law from that place. Now the law, you see, in order to understand the law, you must walk in the spirit. Because the law is an external speaking of an internal state of being. Without the understanding of the internal state of being, namely the internal state of being of God, without reference to that, the only thing that you could understand then is thou shalt and thou shalt not. That's why when Jesus came, representing the coming of Mount Zion, he said, it was said before, and he quoted the law, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you look on a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery with her in your heart already. Or it was said, um, you, you, you should not kill, quoting the Ten Commandments, quoting some of the commandments on the list of the ten. He said, but if you hate your brother without a cause, then you're guilty of murder. Speaks of lusting in the heart, uh, committing murder in the heart, and so on, as what was behind the law. So he would tell the Israelites, Jesus would, you tell the Jews in his day, you search the Scriptures because in them you think you have life and yet they testify of Me and you won't come to Me. Because those under the law, then and now, do not understand the need for the revealing of the mind of God which was presented in a type and shadow in the form of commandments. In the law, in the secular law, uh, when a court meets to decide a case and certain laws are brought forth as a standard, lawyers will, will commonly argue about, quote, the legislative intent. That means that's the question of 
What were the legislators thinking when they wrote this law? Because all law is to accomplish a particular purpose. But if you take the law apart from legislative intent, you just have do's and don'ts. And whether or not the intent of the legislature was understood and brought forth is quite another matter. This actually is what people have against lawyers, what the general population has against lawyers is they they see the application of law often in a fashion and they see the argument (coughs) for the application of law often in a fashion that is arbitrary and capricious, which means it's not related to anything, it's just that it says so right here. But where God was concerned, what was written on tablets of stone and what was written in the book of the law had an intent behind it and it was the intent of the person who wrote it. So even as much as the finger of God, as it were, wrote on tablets of stone, we are sure that God's intention <coughs> pardon me, was behind the force of what He said. Who could know the mind of God then? Christ, of course because Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the sent one. He is the one who comes from the Father as the Son, because the Father loves the Son and shows the Son what the Father is thinking, what the Father is doing. So the Son would say, I only do what I see my Father doing. Now, is this a violation of the law? No, no. Whereas it's not an argument for keeping the law, it is not saying the law has no relevance, it's saying the law is the lowest threshold of understanding in the process of coming to know the mind of God. When you know God, you're not bound by that that is written, you're bound by He who controls your very thoughts. And so you live in a higher realm. I'll give you an example. What was the promise of the law to the people if they kept the law? The promise was that none of their natural circumstances, none of their natural circumstances would be adversely affected. What do you mean? Well, your crops will not rot in the field, rain will come on time, the locusts won't devour it, etc. And none of the diseases that happen to the Egyptians uh, will happen to you and I will keep your enemies from overrunning you. What then is the purpose of the law? What was the promise if they kept the law? What was the highest order of the promise if if you kept the law? The highest order was your physical circumstances would be okay, I'll guard those for you. Was there anything beyond that? Well, it said that the law was a schoolmaster, to bring us to Christ. It was to to prevent behaviors that would have taken Israel so far down the path that other nations had gone that there would be no remaining reference in creation to the purposes of God such as the coming of a Messiah to redeem people back to God. But insofar as the law telling the people and the people hearing according to the law 
uh, about the promised Messiah, the longer time went on, the more they forgot that it even had any reference at all to the Messiah, so much so that when He came, they killed Him. The very ones to whom He came killed Him. Now that's not an argument that says had He come to the Greeks, they would have treated Him any better. They would have mocked Him. If you look at what they did with Paul on Mars Hill when he came to talk about the unknown God and they mocked Him. So no, it doesn't make the Jews worse than anybody else. In fact, with the law, the degeneracy of man following the fall uh, was barely, was not restrained hardly at all, except that in the law and in the conscious memory of the people, there were cultural reminders that there was this greater overarching purpose for which the Messiah would come. So the law at its base is not anything more than a shadow of the good things to come. But those good things are far greater than the law ever spoke about, such as propitiation. The law, under the law there was an Ark of the Covenant, a box that contained the the two tablets of stone, it contained the book of the law, it contained a pot of manna and Aaron's rod that budded, all of which was symbolic of this higher order. This, this Ark of the Covenant had, it was a box made of acacia wood overlaid with beaten gold, with two cherubims who overlapped and where their wings overlapped was called the mercy seat. That was a symbol, that was a sign, that was a type and shadow of propitiation, which is to say that when Christ came, He was the box that contained us in the box and God viewed the box with favor because the box was perfectly obedient to God. So that everything that is in the box, namely Christ, the Ark of our Covenant, is attributable to us. What is in the box is the same as, from God's viewpoint, is the same as Christ. So so whatever was given to Christ is equally attributed to us. Now we were meant to be a people, a people. And so out of Christ, arises that that is called Mount Zion as opposed to Mount Sinai. The one was supposed to lead to the other but the people had no remembrance that the law pointed to Christ and to Mount Zion. Zion, there were were two mountains, Uh, one was called Mount Moriah, Uh, and it was a spot where Abraham sacrificed, was going to sacrifice Isaac and where the temple stood. The other mountain was called the city of David, it was where Jerusalem would ultimately uh, sit. It was occupied originally by a king named Melchizedek, or a king whose titles were Melchizedek, who ruled there. Now before it became the city of David, it was a city of the Jebusites and the the spot, the tradition of of the name of that, uh, because of its proximity to Mount Zion, was named after, uh, 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 Mount Moriah was named after the, the, the doings of Abraham in sacrificing or attempting to sacrifice Isaac on that spot. As the city grew, it included both places. And in that place, Abraham said, God, when God provided the ram 
instead of the son, Abraham said, for here God provideth. And he used the term Jehovah Jireh, which is Jireh is the God provides, Jehovah provides, provides his own sacrifice. By the time of David, both Mount Zion and uh, uh, Mount Moriah were included within what is called the city of David. And it came to be known as Jairah uh, Shalom, which is the Lord, God provides peace. So Jairah Shalom is Jerusalem, which is in this place God provides Jairah peace, speaking of the kingdom of God, righteousness, peace and joy. And it's a promise that is now being picked up in the book of Hebrews, which says, you have come to Mount Zion, the place where God provideth peace. Why? Because it's the picture of the box of reconciliation between God and man. Now this Hebrews chapter 2 spoke of uh, the, the box, the the propitiation. So the subject matter of Hebrews 2, which moves all the way through the the book to Hebrews 12 at verse, uh, uh, Hebrews 10 rather, at verse 25 which says, against the day of the assembling. It's speaking about the assembling to Christ as members of His body typified by the box of propitiation which, to which we were introduced early in the sequence of thought that is the book of Hebrews. So by the time he comes to chapter 10, he's talking about a day against which this assembling would be completed. And then in chapter 12, where we now are, he's talking about having been actually brought to the general assembling and church of the firstborn. The, the, the uh, way he says, you have not come to a mountain, uh, etc., but you, but you have come to Mount Zion, the, 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 the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of, of, the, of the saints, and here, this is the coming together of those who are of the firstborn. And uh, um, the, 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 here it's talking about the, 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 the total gathering up of, and the final result of that which has been moved from episynagogo, assembling together to the gathering together, to the final, the final gathering together of the ecclesia. And it's, it speaks of the pangurius of the ecclesia. So if you want to know what the church is being gathered to, the ecclesia, not a building, for a building is not the church. Everybody knows that, but, but here again people are pretending that it's something else. When the pan, mean, pan means all together, okay? But in speaking of the process of gathering it all together, that's the episynagogue. When the finished work is, that's the panguria of the ecclesia, of the firstborn. And there's a day by which that is to be complete. And that's the day when the testimony in the earth is between the bride and the spirit. And the the witness of the two in the earth, the bride and the spirit, is heard in heaven. And that's the day when there will be the trumpet sound is one of the things that this speaks of. You have come to uh, 
the General Assembly and Church of the Firstborn um, and the announcement is made as with the trumpet sound and it speaks of, for the day of the Lord shall come uh, with the shout of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and then the dead in Christ shall arise first and then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air and so will we be with the Lord from then on. So this assembling is a very necessary uh, component, it doesn't just happen one day when when the angel uh, sounds a trumpet from heaven to announce the return of the Lord, no, the work of the Holy Spirit in the earth is the assembling of the body of Christ and he does that from the very first time that the body was available to be assembled to. For the Spirit, for 1 Corinthians 12 tells us, for by one Spirit are you baptized into one body. So the beginning of the assembling of the body of Christ is done by the Spirit, not by the volition of people who go down to church on Sunday. There is a joining of bone to his bone. He assembles the parts, the Holy Spirit does, he assembles the parts of this Corpus Christi in exactly the manner that they were designed to be assembled. So you, you should not forsake that assembling because it's being done according to a day, against the background of a day when the assembling will have been complete. And so in the next broadcast I'll talk about the specific assignment of parts and the assembling by the Holy Spirit because only the Spirit of God knows how the parts fit together. Why? Because the Spirit searches the deep things of God the Spirit searches the mind of God and finds you and finds where you fit and assembles you into that body. If you forsake that assembling, where then do you fit? What is it that God is going to save eventually? That body. If you neglect your being assembled, what is the outcome? there is no more sacrifice for sin, it's done, you've rejected the only thing that God offered. Now that's why the rest of what was said in Hebrews 10 was said and not the foolishness of preachers who try to get you to come to church on Sunday during the coronavirus. I'll continue on from here.